Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video we're going to focus on how to write a two-part straightforward canon. Now at one level you might think oh well canon's easy isn't it? You know you have one part starts off with a tune and another part does the same tune following on. But if you've ever tried to write a canon you might well have got a bit stuck with this. So I want to show you what I think is the easiest way to do this. Um, and whether you want to write canon or not, actually learning to write canon is a very useful step in the direction of being more confident about writing counterpoint. So counterpoint is all about independent melodic lines. So it's a kind of linear process where one line is kind of doing something melodically and another line comes in and joins it. Fits with it, but it's also doing something melodically. So lots of people are very happy writing music that's homophonic, in other words, that's chordal really, being constructed vertically, even though it might have a melody running over the top of the chords. But what happens if you want to write something that's more contrapuntal? In other words, it's got these linear lines that are kind of layered on top of each other. It may be a technique you want to develop, it may be something that you think actually that would be a nice thing to use in contrast to homophonic sections in a piece that I might be writing. So I think learning to write canon has a lot of practical application. So it's partly so you can see how a canon might be playing out in a particular piece you're playing, but it's mainly focused on actually how do I write a canon? And the first thing I'd say, and I'm just going to do six bars, it's going to be fairly short, but just to show the technique. If you were to set about writing a melody in the treble clef and then hoping that it would all work in canon in the bass clef or vice versa, then let me say it won't work. It's just going to end up with all sorts of notes clashing and things not fitting together because as well as melodic threads you've got to make sure it's going to work harmonically. So let me suggest that the best way of going about this is to kind of treat it one step at a time. Let's get writing and then you can see what I mean. I'm going to start in the first bar by letting the treble clef part start first. It's a two part canon. And just as a very simple idea, let's start with the tonic note C and then have a little ascending scale. So it's not rocket science, just a fairly kind of simple musical idea, if you like. And then maybe so we don't just keep going up will kind of go down a note at the beginning of the next bar. Great, so there's an initial idea. C, D, E, F, E. Now, the left hand needs to start somewhere. So you don't want the left hand to start here, obviously, because then it's not gonna work in canon. It could possibly start here, so that I have my C, D, and then the bass going C, D, E. So it could start there, two notes behind the right hand, or it could start in the next bar, the next measure. And that's where I'm going to start this one. Because if we just have a rest in there then, it's making the point about how to go about this. We've now got five notes in the right hand. Very simple idea, just going up a scale and stepping down a note. Now, if we want this to work in canon, Let's now map that right hand into the left hand or the bass clef. I'm sort of assuming that we're writing for, for piano, but it could be for anything else. So those notes that I've just written in the right hand are now going into the left hand. So, so far we've got. So you can see in here that the bass clef is mapping the right hand one bar, one measure behind it. Okay, now if I've done that, then I can go back to the second bar, the second measure and think, what can I now write in the treble clef in the right hand that fits with the left hand, but then would work to continue in the next bar, the next measure in the left hand. So we don't want the whole piece to go in quarter notes or crotchets. That's going to be a bit tedious, isn't it? So we need something with a bit more kind of rhythmic identity 
either some faster notes or some slower notes. So how about we do something like this in the second bar, the second measure, to, to tum, and then I perhaps go on and do something like this. Um, maybe if I do that. Okay, now the important thing is that we're now writing some new material, but also we're writing material that's got a little bit of rhythmic independence and fits with the left hand. So, so far we've got this. So you can see, I see that fits. And it's also hopefully a little bit more interesting because it's got those quavers, those eighth notes, and there's a little element of dissonance about it. In other words, I'm treating this note as an appoggiatura onto this note. And then I'm treating this note as an accented passing note or accented passing tone onto this note that fits with the harmony. So then you can see that the harmonic life of this is working out as chord one. And then with this appoggiatura, I'm perhaps suggesting here a seven in first inversion and then maybe suggesting a one in first inversion. Sorry, first inversion. So what this is, is a kind of replacement passing 6-4. I'm moving between chord one and chord one B. I can use chord five in second inversion, five C in between, or I can replace that five in second inversion with a seven in first inversion, a seven B. That's what I'm doing here. So you see the harmonic thinking has got to be good. And then I'm gonna use a chord four here, and this is simply an accented passing note or passing tone. So I'm not just writing something that maps the same rhythm as the left hand. I'm not just writing something that fits straightforward harmony. I'm trying now to introduce some inessential notes so that the music has enough interest. Okay, so see if you can hear what's happening melodically and also hear what's happening harmonically. You might also notice that having had all this kind of conjunct movement, I'm purposely introducing a leap there before more conjunct movement. So we've just got something kind of distinctive happening in that balance of conjunct disjunct movement. And it's nice to have that more noticeable disjunct movement as the left hand begins in conjunct movement. So you're sort of thinking, how do I write a canon, but get this little bit of independence going? So, so far. seems to be kind of doing the trick, doesn't it? Now, if we're carrying on in canon, obviously what we've now got to do is we've got to carry on copying the next bit of the right hand into the left hand. So you see what I'm doing now. So just in case there's any confusion here, you can see that this bit that I wrote a moment ago in the right hand, is now going into this left hand. Okay, so, so far, what have we got? We've got this. And we're already getting on for halfway through our canon. Well, that's pretty good, isn't it? Okay, so do you see what I'm doing? I'm doing a bar or a measure of the top part, then I'm mapping that onto the next bar, the next measure of the bottom part, then I'm going back and writing the upper part, copying the new upper part into the next measure of the bottom part, going back, writing the upper part. It may seem a funny way of doing it, but it ensures that your canon all works and that you get good harmony. You can see you can't just write six measures in this case and then hope that the other part will all play out beautifully alongside it because it probably won't. Okay, now in the second measure, I change the rhythm by having some eighth notes, some quavers. So maybe in the third measure, I'm now gonna introduce a longer note. So how about we do this and just have two beats there so that the left hand is moving and it's fitting with the harmony of the right hand, but the right hand is just being a bit steadier. And then of course, one tried and tested thing you can always do is to run in thirds or six with 
the other part. And then actually what I might do is just kind of keep that scale run going. So here is the new material in the right hand. And hopefully you can hear that fits with the left hand. So that all seems to fit quite comfortably. And having written that new material in the right hand, I can then make that happen in the left hand. So there's that E for two beats. And then I'm going to pursue this as before into the next bar. So you begin to see how this is working out. Again, you know, in terms of what's happening with the, with the harmony of this, well, all of this is chord one, and I'm just using this as a lower auxiliary note or a lower neighbor tone. And then this kind of running in thirds thing, well, you know, what's happening here, this is really a sort of chord five, isn't it? And then we've got double passing notes, passing tones, and we're still on chord five there with an unaccented passing note, passing tone. And then it's looking like a one in first inversion there. Okay, so you can see that I'm always thinking harmonically as well as melodically. And trying to get a little bit of rhythmic independence between the two parts as the canon plays out. Okay, now we've got to write some new stuff upstairs. So how about something like we have a bit of movement there because the lower part is steady and then slow it down in the upper part because the lower part is busy. You see how I'm sort of doing this? And then a slower moving note there while the left hand is kind of busy. Okay, well, how does that work out? I think that will work out quite nicely. So if we look at what this means then from this kind of new bit here, we've got... So that sort of works quite well, doesn't it? All this is really continuing this chord one in first inversion. Uh, this is all chord one, but we're kind of using this as the accented passing note this time. You see, it's interesting how the function can change. Here, it was a chord tone or a harmony note. Here, we're using it as an inessential note, as a non-chord tone. And then using this as a passing note or a passing tone, this all being chord five means that's harmony. This is passing back to harmony again. So you can kind of make life a bit interesting by just kind of moving the uh, significance of notes in the canon. So sometimes it's a chord tone or a harmony note. Sometimes it's a non-chord tone uh, or an inessential note. Okay, now then, we've now got to move on to map the new material from the right hand into the left hand. So C, D, E, and then D is going to take us there, isn't it? And we're coming to the end of these um, six bars, six measures. So perhaps we ought to think about how it's going to finish. Well, actually, if we just move that onto a C and then move this onto a C, that's going to give us a promising finish, isn't it? You've got to keep thinking about cadences and, and so on as well when you come to the end of a phrase. And then you see, effectively, the canon has played out, isn't it? Because if you now look at the left hand, it's copied everything from the right hand, isn't it? But now the right hand has finished the canon. We started the left hand with the rest. So the right hand is just going to have to finish off. So what could we do in the right hand? Well, we could tie that C over and turn it into a 7-6 suspension for the final cadence. So that'd be a rather fun thing to do with it, wouldn't it? So that last bit goes. So I'm trying to get a bit of counterpoint between the two parts, rhythmic counterpoint and melodic counterpoint. And so you end up hearing two independent lines, but it's all working in strict canon. And you see at the end, I've just had to put those notes in the right hand to finish the canon off. 
but it's all going to make harmonic sense and have a balance of chord tones and non-chord tones or uh, harmony notes and inessential notes. Okay, how does our two-part canon come together? Works very nicely, doesn't it? So that's a strict canon. In other words, every single note that comes in one part comes in the other part, just a few beats behind. And we run it absolutely without alteration. Now you can write a freer canon where you're copying it, but maybe just modifying things every now and again, um, just because it's expedient to do so. I think it's a really good discipline to make yourself do a few exercises in writing strict canon. And then if you want to write some freer canon, well, of course you're free to do it. But you see how it develops and a kind of awareness of some of the issues of counterpoint, this idea of rhythmic independence, making it make harmonic sense as well as linear sense, having something that works as a melodic line, not just a sort of device that's going to work out in canon. So you've got to think about all these things as you go. But there we are, writing a strict two-part canon. Well, if you've enjoyed this video, let me invite you to the Music Matters website, www.mmcourses.co.uk. When you get there, have a click on Courses, and then have a look at what resources we have for composers. There's a composing course, there's a writing counterpoint course, there's a more modern course on 12 tone composition, if you want to have a look at that. Lots of other things there besides, but you may be interested in just developing these kind of compositional skills a bit further. There's a lot else on the website, courses, how to join our Music Matters Maestros community, but have a look at it, www.mmcourses.co.uk.